Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soul Seekers podcast, where we believe that hunting has the power to transform lives through primal adventure, as we share our mission of mentorship is conservation. To learn more about everything we do, check out our show on Carbon TV, or go to soulseekersnation.com. Freedom on, everybody, and stay soulful. This podcast is also proudly brought to you by Onyx Hunt. When I first got into hunting, I kept hearing all about public land and different access and how to find different locations to hunt. I was like, well, how are people even identifying all this stuff? Well, sure enough, I came across the number one hunting GPS app, and that is Onyx Hunt. If you guys want to want to get better at hunting and, and go deeper into your scouting, Onyx Hunt is the number one GPS app for that. Join the millions of hunters who trust Onyx Hunt to find more game, discover new access, and hunt smarter. It was a game changer for me, and I know it's going to be a game changer for you if you've never used it. If you have used it, you know the power that it holds. Guys, I really hope you enjoy this episode. If you want to know more about Onyx, go to onyxmaps.com forward slash hunt and check out their app. Be blessed, freedom on, and stay soulful. All right, guys, if you're in the market for a new hunting rifle this coming year, look no further than a Kelbley's rifle. I've been rocking their Coda rifle for the last couple seasons and I've had great success with it. It's an amazing shooter. And every time I put one of their rifles in somebody's hands, they're like, oh, I got to get one of these. Kelbley's holds over 92 world and national records that are either broken or set on one of their actions or rifles. So they really set a higher level of accuracy. If you want to know more about Kelbley's rifles, go to kelbley.com. That's K-E-L-B-L-Y.com. Tell them Johnny Mac sent you with Soul Seekers. And uh, go enjoy shooting that much more in this coming hunting season. Be blessed, everybody. Go check out Kelbley Rifles. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soul Seekers Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mac, And today we are bringing to you live a brand new episode that I've never done in all 270 plus episodes of the podcast. And today we are dedicating this episode specifically to varmint hunting and everything that goes around it. There's a lot of mystique around, you know, is it actually hunting? What do you do with the animals? Is it a great gateway to get into hunting? And so much more. We're going to be talking all about that. We got the, uh, the owner of Varmeter Online Magazine, Varmeter.com. Eric Mayer is here to join us and talk to us about his journey of growing up in L.A. and being raised in an anti-gun home to taking a hunter safety course, shooting, getting the, the uh, itch to become a hunter, and what it's done for him and his life and his journey and the trajectory that it set his path on. So without further ado, my man, Eric, how you doing, brother? Pretty good, man. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it's it. great to have you. Are you kidding me? Come on now. Yeah. It, you know, when good people get together, uh, amazing things happen. So, oh, yeah. And yeah. I could talk vermin hunting forever, so beware. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Get that well, reel, reel wound up real well, so. Yes. Well, <laughs> the, you know, the, the most interesting thing is I, I came from the state of Washington, and I remember talking with a lot of different hunters, and they had a hard time. Uh, they, I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm picturing a couple different people that I interacted with. They had a hard time with the idea of coyote hunting. They're like, how can you just kill something and then not take the meat, not do anything with it, or or all that? Mm -hmm. and, I, and so it led into a larger discussion, which we're going to get into here on this episode. But, but brother, tell us a little bit of background. Like, I want to hear your story. You grew up in L.A. You, you... Okay, so yeah, I grew up in I grew up in the city of L.A. It's uh, San Fernando Valley, north of L.A. city proper. And it was during those years, you know, I was born in 67. So I grew up in the seventies there. It was during those years when they were building, you know, believe it or not, those areas still had, you know, orange orchards and, you know, grapefruit and big fields and ground squirrels and everything like that around there. Yeah. So I actually got started uh, pretty late because my mom, you know, I, I was raised by my mom. My dad had passed away. She had remarried. They got a divorce, but my mom was completely anti-gun 
anti-hunting, anti-anything having to do with any of that stuff. And what happened is first I went out and went to Gemco, you know, it's this store like a Target, but a little more, uh, less classy, I guess you'd say. <laughs> and well, they had everything. And I bought myself a Daisy 880. And back then they didn't care what age you were and got that. And I actually uh, was using pellets. Uh huh. So I started just shooting. I mean, I was probably 12 and I was just shooting around my neighborhood. I'd shoot dove off the wire, go home, pluck them, you know, bring them over to my neighbor's house. He'd cook them up for me and stuff like that. And, you know, basically did that. And then when I started uh, junior high and high school, uh, I met up with a group of boys who all their dads took them hunting and everything like that. And I kind of moved into that group and they became my mentors. And for me, you know, growing up and I love my mom to death. She passed away a few years ago. She's an awesome woman. You know, she lived in her nineties. She's just, she worked her butt off. She had two boys who were just too smart for their own good and all that. But there was also a lot of tension between us mm. and this was my escape. You know, it was definitely my escape. So fast forward 1982, you know, I'm talking to my buddy, Jeff Lovato. We're like, Hey, we need to get our hunting licenses. We need to be serious about this. And I mean, we're young 1982 from 67. We're still pretty young. Yeah. And I knew my mom wouldn't take me, uh, Jeff's dad worked. So we ended up riding our bikes to the first class. And then I'll never forget his name, Walter Swarthout, Walter M. Swarthout, an uh, older guy. And he was running the class and he just basically mentored us during the class and said, hey, I'll come pick you guys up. I'll drop you off. So we had to do our classes and then we had range days and he took us and he took us to the range days and we took the test and we passed and everything. And, you know, I still have my hunter safety card with his name scribbled on it, you know, around here somewhere. And it's just like, you know, you remember those things in such detail because it's life changing. And after that, it's like I became so focused on it because it was an outlet for me. Yeah. You know, you, you talk about guys doing sports and riding bikes or skateboards. And I did all that stuff. But this was something where it was just solace for me, for a kid who was growing up in a suburban environment. But I didn't have a dad. I didn't have any mentors. Got in this group. These guys were like dads to me. They helped me out. Yeah. I one gentleman on my street who, you know, he took me in, he, him and his wife took me in and he was all about farming and trapping and he ran a business for trapping and, and I'd go with him on the weekends and go and trap gophers and other critters and stuff like that. And it just, I mean, just immersed me in this in the middle of the city, mm -hmm. you know, and it just turned out to be that. And then it just kind of took over. I mean, we were, we were predator hunting. Literally, we had a record player that was playing the Johnny Stewart record player that was playing the little Johnny Stewart albums. And then, oh my gosh, Johnny Stewart releases the electronic with the tape deck. Yeah. Lined out the speaker. And I'm sitting in the eighties in my double tape deck boom box, mixing the space in the beginning so I could put the call farther out and walk back to the stand and have like two minutes to let everything settle down. <laughs> then I mean, I was like doing all this stuff and you know, I had next to my sticks and, you know, the cars tapes, I had all my, you know, my Johnny Stewart Jackrabbit number 100 and everything. It was just, it was just cool. And, you know, there's, I remember the first coyote I shot. I remember the first quail I shot, dove I shot. I mean, the first bobcat I shot was just absolutely amazing. I remember that like it happened yesterday. And those memories just, just stick with me. But with that as a base, just as a core base, I just knew somewhere in my life I wanted this to be my direction. Mm. I wanted this to do, and I wanted to educate, and I wanted to try to teach people, and you know, kind of not be, not be so above everybody else. I, I absolutely hate feeling that way because I learn from people all the time. You know, it depends on what the subject is or everything. I'm not the end all be all. I people correct me all the time. I take that information and I change what I'm thinking and it just, it helps. Yeah. So, man, that's, yeah. qu that's quite an intro and great background. You know, I don't, you probably don't know this, but, uh, we here at the podcast, we have uh, quite a few different taglines. One of them being that, uh, hunting has the power to transform lives through primal yeah. adventure. And you are mentioning that you're talking about that, how, how your life was 100% transformed from the moment that you got introduced to hunting 
and you could do something with it. Uh, it, it, was. Did, did, it was. Did this mentor gentleman of, of yours, did he ever take you big game hunting? No, um, I did go big game hunting around Los Angeles. Uh, even back then, it wasn't so great. We did a lot of archery hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, my first deer killed with a bow was actually with a friend of mine, this guy, Mark Bonnet, who passed away a few years ago. But um, we were behind the, I don't know if you remember all of you during the Silmar earthquake back in the 70s. But anyways, behind the old all of you hospital, because it collapsed basically during the earthquake, they had to you know, condemn a lot of it. Yeah. It, it's this this rainforest of oak trees and all the deer would come down. And I mean, I, I have a mind where I can play stuff back like a movie. So it's, it's good and it's bad, but in this case, it was good. I'll never forget seeing, you know, uh, a little spike coming down like that. And then a little two by spike. And he says, uh, are you going to take the big one? I said, I'm going to take the bigger one. Cause what he didn't see, there was a, another you know forky coming down you know and then it ended up having an extra point in there and all that and and i smoked him you know with my bow and you know my east it was a matthews solo cam the first solo cam ever released which i still have okay and using aluminum xx75 eastern arrows you know like that (laughs) it was hilarious but no i mean that was cool i i love big game hunting but i'll tell you what in the story that i tell people is the time I got drawn for X9A zone. That's up in the Eastern Sierra part of California. Gorgeous area, beautiful. You would not think you're in California when you're up there. Mm. And I got drawn and it was a difficult, even back then, a difficult zone to get drawn for. And I hiked all the way up into this valley and I dropped in this valley and all of a sudden I look over and I'm like, what is that on that rock? You know, I had shot ground throws and everything, but I'd never seen a rock chuck. And I looked over and I was like, that's a rock chuck. I hooked all the way back down the hill to my Jeep Cherokee, pulled out my rifle, and hiked all the way up and spent the rest of the trip shooting rock chucks. <laughs> I just bypassed the tag. I was there for a week. All I did was go from canyon to canyon to canyon shooting rock chucks. <laughs> I had so much fun. It was just like, I'm, I love shooting rock chucks. And in Idaho here, we have tons of them everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, although they're on public land, we're careful about that, but we'll get into that later on. But, um, it was just something where big game hunting is great. I'll buy a general tag, but I don't really go after big game. It's not my thing. Um, I will sometimes go out just because I want some meat. When I moved to Idaho, I did an elk hunt, you know, with the muzzleloader, which was cool. I got a nice cow elk and everything. But no, it's varmints for me, coyotes and varmints. I am a huge, huge fan of that. Man, that is um, awesome. What, what is it about the varmints that got you going? Like, like I understand in just a little background on myself is I I grew up and I have wrote a book. I have yet to release it yet. uh, But I talk about how uh, when I got home from school, I wanted to grab my Red Rider BB gun and I would set up GI Joes and green army men in the backyard. And I just blast them all day long, all day long. Just bam, bam, bam. Like that was my childhood. I played sports. I played college football and lacrosse. But sports come to an end at some point, like yeah. squeezing the trigger and watching your accuracy and your thought process, you know, go down range and, and hit what you're, hit, you're aiming at. It's like, it's extremely rewarding. Um, so for yeah. you, what, what was it that like, why varmints? I'll tell you what, um, as a kid, okay, we all go in phases in hunting. Well, I should say most of us do. There's some adults that continue the first phase, which is kill everything. Yeah. I'm sorry, but it's like, I want to kill as much as I It's all the numbers. I want numbers. I want this. I want the biggest, the best. And then we kind of slowly move into that next zone, which is, eh, I don't need to shoot that guy today, you know, or, oh, I want to make sure there's some more rabbits over here. So I'm going to leave those guys. Mm-hmm. And the next phase is kind of like, latter you know the latter part of your life where it's education where you you get enjoyment and i do i get enjoyment sitting behind the camera and videoing my guys or new folks and stuff like that you know shooting shooting stuff that i point out or find or you know scout out so you know back to the reasons because at the time i was i want to get as much as i can i mean one deer a year i know know, (laughs) you know i think you know we had california ground squirrels and those things could get up over two pounds 
you know, and you would call them ground grizzlies and stuff like that. And we'd go up to the hills and there'd be, they'd be everywhere. And we could spend a day, we archery hunted in Simi Valley, you know, we air gun hunted in Northridge, you know, all these cities where they just had green space where you could just go there and nobody batted an eye when they saw a couple of kids out there roaming around doing that. Right. And that was the whole thing. Numbers. It was all about numbers. And honestly, I think it, Barma hunting is, especially like ground squirrel and other colony varmints. Now, I treat ground squirrels differently than I treat like rock chucks, and I'll get into that more. But ground squirrel hunts, like around us, we have what they call whistle pigs, so the northern Paiute ground squirrel, or smaller ground squirrel. But they're everywhere, all over public land. You always see families out, you know, with their kids, and they're out shooting them and stuff like that. Kids get bored really fast. You know, you can take them out and shoot targets. Targets are fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always recommend if you're taking a kid out, don't just have them punch paper. Get some reactive targets. Steel targets are great. You know, I have a neighbor who just took his girls out shooting and MGM targets is near me. And so I have some pop-up prairie dogs, you know, steel. Oh, cool. Yeah. You know, and you put them out there and they're like doing the hunt and stuff like that. And it's it's fun and exciting. But at some point they're like, okay, I want to do more. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not to discount target shooting. I mean, target shooting is cool and all that, yeah. but you get in that next thing where mentally you want, I mean, it's just the way we are. You want to just move to the next level. You want to have reactive targets that are kind of real. And in a sense, shooting varmints is, is clean. And I'm going to get a, probably some hate from the antis out there, but to me, it's clean because you're actually, if you're not helping the farmers or, you know, helping the environment or something like that, you know, then why are you doing it? Well, all kind of fall into that. You know, we, we hunt ranches where it's either they poison with a poison cabbage or something like that, where they eat it and it's an anticoagulant. They bump the cells, they bleed to death, or they also have blockers that go in the intestines. And I mean, I've seen ground squirrels walking around wobbling like this because they're in so much pain because they cannot go to the bathroom. And it's just gas from the cat building up inside them. It's horrific. I mean, seriously. So, you know, you're out there and you're shooting, sometimes we shoot hundreds in a day and it doesn't even make a scratch, but we're still doing something. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Stick a kid out there, put them in a bench, give them a 1022 or, you know, a little Winchester expert or something like that. And they're going to sit down and have an absolute blast and just watch them do it and shoot them and they don't have to clean them. I mean, I know guys out there, though, oh, yeah, I've got one of the guys over at Guns of America. He, he eats all this weird stuff, and we always go back and forth. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't eat rats. I have a whole video on that. I just don't. Please carry plague. They carry disease, you know, all this other stuff. Sorry. You know, we're not that desperate times yet. I won't mention politics. But anyways. <laughs> um, well, you can. Yeah. That's uh, that, like... <laughs> This is what something I'm releasing an episode this next week, which by the time this airs, it'll already have been released yeah. where I it's about unapologetically speaking the truth about hunting and why it's a right, yeah. not a privilege. Right. And and I just let it rip. It's beautiful. Yeah. It, and and more people need to understand that the Steve Ranella brought in the hey, if you shoot it, you should be eating it. Mm-hmm. And I get it. And I, I, I'm glad that Steve Ranella expanded hunting to a lot of people that didn't. I mean, you got Mark Zuckerberg out there hunting, killing his own food and all that stuff now. Who would have ever thought that? You're still doing stuff to our Facebook pages, but okay, go have your fun. Right. But anyway, you know, although I bring up farmers and things like that, for varmints, listen, if the state biologist is saying that it is an unprotected species, there's zero chance of anything happening to it then I have no problem going out and following the law and shooting whatever I want to shoot. Mm -hmm. But I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Were you going to say something? Well, no, I just to add into this, what a lot of people don't realize is that they're so quick to judge rather than to have uh, an actual perspective. They're quick to jump to an opinion and and a perspective comes from experience. Correct. And it all comes down to emotional relativism. It's relative to that person on the emotional level of exactly. where that animal is placed. If you have a bunch of rats, a bunch of ground chucks, <laughs> rock chucks, ground squirrels, whatever, invading your home, mm-hmm. you're not going to bat an eye at 
all about eradicating every single one of them. Oh yeah. Right. Every like, store you walk into, there's mouse traps sitting on the shelf. Oh yeah. And yeah. it's like there's a mouse and a ground squirrel. They're both rodents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's it's really fascinating where people are like, oh man, I don't know if I could do that. Or I don't know if I like you doing that. Or you know, this is and this is the political side of things is that Oh yeah. Is that when we go based off of ballot box biology and and emotions rather than logic, science, biological data, studies, you know, carrying capacity, all of that, you know, that you know, why is a qualification of an animal's life different because it has fur rather than feathers or four yeah. legs rather than two legs or, you know. Well, I, th- I think the big, I don't want to call it a mental hurdle, but some people have a mental block where, and, and let's go to coyotes since we were bringing that up because coyotes is really that divider. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can see the antis fervently raising millions of dollars to fight everything having to do with hunting fur bears okay first they went after trapping now they're going after like predator contests and things like that well california you know they stopped mountain lion hunting that was by ballot okay that was pure emotion by ballot they banned foothold traps or body holding traps pure emotion by ballot okay and then they went ahead and banned bobcat trapping and then bobcat hunting okay and you know it's something where Okay, so they're bigger animals. Coyotes look like your dog, you know, whatever in there. But the thing is this, is that coyotes expand. They, when you hunt coyotes, if you hunt a certain area, they're biologically set up to replace themselves and do well. Mm -hmm. Coyotes are a menace. I mean, an absolute menace. I mean, right here in my area, you've got a Facebook page. We've got coyote issues, raccoon issues, fox issues, you know, all these people out here who want their hobby farms who ironically moved from California up here to Idaho. Right. And they told their husbands, oh, don't worry, we'll make the mortgage because I'm going to sell eggs, you know, or whatever it happens to be. And next thing you know, they're posting on Facebook horrified because they're finding chicken heads laying around and they don't know what's going on. Yeah. And people are saying they're predators. Oh, well, I want them dead because suddenly they're affecting, you know, it's their a- chicken they've named. You know, yeah. and in their life before it had nothing to do with it. I mean, I go down near LAX where I used to live. You know, I moved after the 94 earthquake over by the airport and there's signs all over the place warning people of coyotes, pets being missing, all that stuff. And we're talking about the city of Los Angeles and they can't do anything about it because mm. they can't trap them. No coyotes going into a box trap. I know a few guys out there that can put them into a, a cage trap, yeah. but very it's few. It's hard, are... hard to do for sure. Exactly. So, you know, and then you, you get to the whole, are you going to eat it thing again that I brought up and Hey, if you want to eat it, go for it. Yeah. You know, go for it. I don't personally hunt bear because I don't like the taste of bear meat. Hmm. So I'm like, eh, I'm just not going to hunt it. It's not high on my list to do. It's cool. I, I admire a lot of people that do it. You yeah. know, they, they do great and they work on it and it's a tough hunt, I believe, but it's just not for me, but I'll go out and kill coyotes all day long. You know, but again, I put a self-imposed thing on me. I stop hunting coyotes unless it's for a farmer that requests in the end of February. I don't hunt them again until like up here early to mid-September. Mm. Rock chucks, you know, bringing that one up. So how I was talking about ground squirrels being different from rock chucks. Rock chucks don't breed as quickly as ground squirrels, you know. So when we go into a public land area, we've got a canyon that we hunt. We'll go in if there's... 10 rock checks, we'll take two or three. Yeah. We'll take the smaller ones. We wait till the babies come out. We take the smaller ones because the big ones are the breeders that are guaranteed to be breeding for the next year. And that's just something I self impose, but I urge people when they do get into this, you know, pay attention to what, you know, the, the animal population is telling you. Don't go in and wipe them all out and then get on Facebook the next year and go, oh, I can't find any rock checks to shoot. Oh, duh. Well, I shoot, and I'm going to get hate for this, but oh, I'm I'm shooting these four puppies. That, well, I'm sorry, four hard chargers that came running at me, and I got all four of them, this and that, and then in fall, they're like, ah, we went calling. We didn't call on anything. Yeah. Well, come on. 
I mean, there's a balance there, even for us varmint hunters as well. And that's kind of what I think sets me and a lot of the people that I hunt with apart. We look at that seriously and take that into consideration. It's really fascinating. How many new hunters have you hooked from allowing them opportunity to start hunting through varmint hunting? A lot. I can't give you numbers, but one one that part that rem, I remember a lot was again the Eastern Sierra part of California. There was a guy on Calguns.net on the forum on the hunting forum. He said, "Hey, let's put together a hunt." This was years ago. Let's put together a hunt where we take all these new guys out and all the mentors go out and we go jackrabbit hunting. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was a blast. We had so many people go, and I'm friends with still a lot of the people that I help mentor and stuff like that, and I I've hunted with them since, and it's just you know, those are the ones that stand out. You know, I have a lot of acquaintances that are from that, but you know, on this street right here, okay, any kid on my street who get their gets their hunter safety certificate, they do it. And they walk to my door, they say, here. Then I walk back in and you know, call their dad up when it's in stock or the, or their mom. In most cases it's the dad. They meet me at the shop and I transfer a Ruger 1022 to them that they give to that kid. Wow that and they get a couple couple hundred rounds of ammo and go do it so and everybody should do that yeah i mean 250 bucks to change a kid's life is small change small change it's another it's another hunter out there and and listen i get it there's a big push right now because there's a lot of people saying especially in turkey hunting world which i i'm kind of in kind of out i don't really i've never killed a turkey but one day but anyways, there's a big push to say, hey, we're we're getting too many hunters involved in this. There's too many hunters getting out there and they're going and hitting five different states and they're collecting as many birds as they can and they're fanning and they're doing all this stuff. Well, guess what? Get them started on varmint hunting. It doesn't matter. You know, there's varmints everywhere. Yeah. These kids down there went out shooting the targets and stuff like that and they saw ground squirrels around. Now, mentally, the daughter, the oldest daughter who has the hunting license, wasn't ready for it. That's okay. She may never be ready for it, but the option is right there, you know, and then they, they move into other things. But I mean, I don't discount any kind of hunting when it comes to kids. And I, I think a lot of kids are really lucky that they've had parents that will take them out and, you know, get them on property with all the junior hunts and everything. I think it's awesome. I really do because there's plenty to go around and as adults, or I should personally say me as an adult, you know, I can stop any kind of need where I need to shoot that buck. I don't care. Oh, there's a couple of rock tricks there. I haven't, I haven't shot a rock trick in two weeks. Take the shot. You know why? Because they're going to remember that just like I remembered my first quail, my first dove, my first rock trick, you know, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. That, that memory is burned in there for life. So my, so 10 years ago, I took my hunter safety course. I, have always been a gun enthusiast was raised in a home where uh, my dad did not hunt. He did not shoot, never took me out shooting, never taught me gun safety, any of that. So I, I journeyed down wanting to, to do my own. Like, you know, I watched Western movies and the idea of, of being self-reliant and this lone cowboy up on his horse on the prairie, just, you know, doing it. Like that was my childhood growing up in my mind. And I, I definitely find a, a, an affinity for Western culture because it's so special to me. And, and ironic, I moved to something that's hilarious, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I got into hunting, it, I, well, I got into shooting. I bought my first rifle. My first rifle was uh, an AR-223 uh, and wanted to start shooting them. I was like, well, okay. Well, I coached high school football, basketball, track. All my seasons were taken care of. So what was the one animal that you could hunt year-round? Coyotes in the state of Washington. I was like, yeah, I'm a coyote hunter. And so I just started consuming as much knowledge and content as I could to understand how to be the best coyote hunter I could. Turns out, I still am not that good. (laughs) Like, I have a, like, let's see here. Is that you? That's me. Oh my gosh. I almost lost your crap when I when uh, somebody gave me those cap guns. Go oh, ahead. that's awesome. See, okay, that's a perfect example. Cap guns. Every boy's childhood like pat pat 
bat, bat, bat. Oh, yeah. It's hard to find those anymore. So the, what the, without getting uh, too long-winded on this, the whole idea was I got into coyote hunting and then realized that that was super cool, but I wanted to kill something big. I wanted to right. eat some meat. And so I got into bear hunting because that was open before fall football season started. So I, my first big game animal that I ever killed was a black bear. Um, and what I realized very quickly is like, man, any type of hunting is fun. Shooting guns is fun. Like, right. like you want to put the F U in fun. Let's go shoot some guns <laughs> because it's a, it's a literal and actual blast. Well, I went out to my buddy's house out in North Dakota. He was a former uh, roommate of mine and, and college friend. I was like, Hey Jeff, I got my hunter safety. I, I got uh, an AR. Let's go shoot. Let's go hunt. Let's, let's do something. And he took me out to uh, some public land where there's nothing but ground squirrels, prairie dogs, or, you know, prairie dog village, I guess yeah. is what it was. And I was like, this is awesome. He goes, we're just going to park the car. We, we laid prone rather than having a table to sit off of. Yeah. And he goes, just wait. You'll shoot. They'll all scatter. And then about five minutes later, they'll start popping back up. And yep. talk about time flying. Absolutely just escaped yep. us. It was so addicting and consuming. And to this day, I've yet to go back and do it a second time. But I really want to film an episode of my show, Soul Seekers, and, and film a varmint hunting episode to show people how important it is, especially with the mission of mentorship is conservation. If you want hunting to last for generations to come, you got to invest in the hearts and lives of other people. Maybe that's something you and I need to need to team up for and do it. create an episode for. We can definitely do that. That's a year I round mean, thing. There's no, there's no seasons for it. Correct. No, there isn't. And well, so up here, uh, our ground schools go down about mid June. They go down on the ground. You don't see them again until January, February. Huh. It's the craziest thing. But, you know, we still have Colombian ground squirrels in the mountains. You know, we have the prairie dogs over in Wyoming are still out all year round. Prairie dogs are, you know, they're out most of the year and all that stuff. But, you know, it, it's something where if I want to do that, then I can do it anytime. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my favorite places when I lived in Los Angeles was heading over to like northern Arizona or you know, Southwest Colorado, because you're in, you know, the monsoonal season, it's July, but it's only in the 80s. And not only is it just pure eye candy being out there, all the views and everything like that, yeah. but you're also just having fun. But, you know, I, I didn't care if I shot 20 prairie dogs. I was totally cool with that because it was such an experience to go and do that. And I mean, just like you just did it, you just reran exactly what happened that day. Like it happened yesterday. Yeah. That is what it's all about. I mean, everybody out there remembers who varmints hunts, remembers an epic day of varmint hunting. There's not one person I know of that doesn't have a bunch of those in their head where they're like, and I remember this day and I got this guy and then I got a double on this because lots of things happen with varmint hunting. You can pull out any gun you want. You know, right. you can use any cartridge you want. You know, you're using the AR-15. Yeah. You know, when you build that AR-15, it wasn't to go shoot prairie dogs. <laughs> nope, not at all. <laughs> you know, and and it, it's the same thing with coyote hunting. You know, yeah, you want to be ethical, so use a cartridge that's you know big enough that's going to drop the coyote and everything like that. But I mean, you can shoot a thirty odd six. You know, mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Yeah. So my first gun. Okay, that I my brother bought. He was four years older than me for me, and I hid in my room. I mean, nowadays <laughs> it's like I had a Ruger 1022. I had a um, Winchester Model 1200. It was like their copy of the 12, but it was like a more modern one. Uh -huh. And I had that 30 odd six in my closet at home. My mom had no idea. I hid it behind boxes and stuff. Oh my gosh! <laughs> but no, I mean I. I don't know if you remember because these were back a ways, but Remington used to make these saboed little 55 grain bullets inside the 30 odd six, the 308, you know, oh, stuff like that. I don't remember that. Holy crap, man. I shot a guy with that at like 20 yards. The sabo hit him. I mean, everything, it just smoked him. And I was like, whoa. So when I got into hand loading, which just was a couple of years later, 
you know, I would load the lightest I could do. And at the time it was 120 grain. My buddy who had a 270 was shooting 90 grain Sierra hollow points oh. from these big game rifles to the only thing we had for predators. And we smoked them and we did everything. Yeah. So that's the thing. You can use anything. Anybody right now, if they've got a gun, they can go in there, grab it and go a coyote hunting. You can grab a hand call at the store and have a blast. Let, let's back up here for a second. And yeah. I, I want to ask you to explain like everyone understands coyote hunting, I, I would imagine, especially people who listen to this podcast. They're like, oh, yeah, coyote hunting, bobcat hunting, yeah. small game. What is varmint hunting? What are varmints? What is the classification so, of like what animals? Varmints are- used to be everything, all from coyotes, so canines to, you know, cats to colony varmints. And what I, when you see me online talking and stuff, I call all ground squirrels, rock chucks, things like that, colony varmints, because for me, that encompasses all the rodents mm. part of that family. Okay. And, and you know, that's because they live in colonies. You know, you see one, there's going to be more like that, prairie dogs, everything like that. And then then you have the the predator side. So since predator calling has in in hunting has gotten so popular, you know, it's split into varmint hunting and predator hunting. And then predator hunting is split into coyote hunting or, you know, everything else. Right. And, you know, it's just kind of like that, but it's all encompassed by varmint hunting. Back in the old days, coyote was a varmint, just like, you know, a ground squirrel was a varmint. And that's just what everybody went after. Yeah. And, you know, nowadays I, I actually, you know, when people talk to me and stuff like that, and I talk about when I do and do not shoot coyotes and everything like that, I, I put coyotes, bobcat, fox, and all that a little bit higher than I do you know, ground squirrels. I I just, for me, they're more intelligent. They're more of a challenge. I want to challenge when I'm hunting them, Mm -hmm. you know, and that could be badgers. I I shoot a lot of badgers, a lot of badgers. Really? Yes. I shoot. We have one farm that we hunt. And I think last year we took about 50 badgers off of it, 28,000 acres. And it just, it's alfalfa farm and they destroy, they absolutely destroy. And I've shot some big ones on there. And you're not calling them. You're just like, happen to see him like so yeah we spot we spot them and then either stock them or do long range shots on and that, that's how it happens we we do call some in occasionally by all means we do um but most of the time it's just you know spotting them and stuff like that in idaho you know it's a little bit different out on the blm land and stuff like that you'll see them you what you do is you stop and i'll tell you my secret i'm either driving and go hey that head doesn't look right you know, right. what's that thing looking at me over there, you uh-huh. know, or, you know, you see their silhouette on a hillside because it's early in the morning or dusk, you know, like that, or you just see dust kicking up for some stupid reason. Mm-hmm. And those guys dig. I have video where we're driving on that same farm at night. My buddy gets out, grabs a shotgun, and I'm videoing with my camera, and he runs 15 feet, takes a shot with a shotgun, runs up to it, and the hole's already packed, closed. It's gone. Wow. So, yeah, but that's badger hunting. But um, no, I mean, and, you know, coyote hunting has, has gotten huge. Coyote hunting in the old days was, you know, and a lot of people don't know this. It was Texas. Everybody knows Texas and coyote hunting, you know, and you got the Burnham brothers and, you know, this and that. California was the same way. Mm. Southern California had some of the biggest coyote contests, the biggest coyote callers out there, you know, everything. And, and a lot of these guys turn into later on in life into archery guys and this and that, but they started, they cut their teeth on predator hunting. Interesting. Yeah. But nowadays it's so popular and everybody does it and spends thousands of dollars on thermal guilty. You know, <laughs> I use some nice stuff, my HGM, you know, I, I moved, I had bearing optics. I know there's some really expensive out there, but I'll tell you what, I went to AGM and I just went on a nighttime jackrabbit hunt for this one rancher. And I was using the 17, I'm getting into details now, the 17556 KAK. So what it is, is KAK industry created this round. It's a 556, neck down is 0.172. Okay. And I'm shooting a 15.5 grain in that at four, close to 4,400 feet per second. What? Then shoot jackrabbits with that through a thermal. And talk about, you look up, you know, you're watching your video when you're done. You're like, is that a falling star? Oh, no, that's not a falling star. That's just the rest of the jackrabbit coming down into the screen after you blew it out of the screen. Right. That It's crazy like that. that, that I got to know more. I'm going to have to find out more about that round. 
Yeah. But anyways, I got off on a tangent. So yeah, so coyote hunting, all this money spent on it and everything like that. But you know what? It's damn exciting. You know, even at my age, you see a coyote, it's like, oh yeah, you know, like that. And they're coming in, they're hunting you. Yeah. And for guys who don't do it and who think it's, you know, I, I lean towards the coyote hunting is kind of easy, you know, especially with all the stuff, if, if you follow it. But I'll tell you what, it took me a good year and a half before we called in the coyote when I was young, yep. you know, and it, it takes some time, but it's, it's learning sign, it's learning calls, it's learning times of year. And a lot of guys have that down. I mean, they do so good online, you know, they post their stuff and things like that. And, and it's awesome. I yeah. mean, it's awesome. See, I'm guilty of sitting there watching thermal coyote videos all night. Oh yeah. Cool. I, I moved to Texas, oh. got my first thermals and all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, this is going to be bad because I don't know when I'm going to sleep. <laughs> exactly. Uh, here's a question for you is yeah. when, when somebody's like, okay, you're, they're hearing you talk. They're like, okay, I got to check out varmint hunting. I got to go experience this. When's the best time of year? How do you go about finding them rather than just like burning gas and, and driving? And or if you are trying to get land access and you're knocking on someone's door and you'd be like, hey, can I just shoot rock chucks or, or prairie dogs? Or like, it, has that gained you access? So I kind of threw a couple different questions at you right there. But so let me start with best time of year. Yeah. Spring. Okay. Don't go too early or, or do what I do. I scout. People, I mean, even today with all the spots I have, we go scout. We drive hundreds of miles in a day checking out areas, looking at them, on X waypointing them, you know, saying, okay, we've seen some. You know, if we don't see babies, we're not shooting anything. And when I say babies, you know, they come out, we wait till they get a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, rock chucks, for example, or, you know, ground schools we can shoot early, but I still don't shoot a lot of those because we still want the young ones to be able to come out and everything like that. But springtime. Springtime for varmints, pretty much everywhere. You got woodchucks in the east, you know, down in Texas. Panhandle's got prairie dogs. Hmm. Uh, I've hunted them up there. So go into, what is it, Lubbock, and they're all over the place because they're protected in town. People get them as pets and then release them in their front yards. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, but no, and then, you know, all over the mountain states. And, and what's kind of cool about it is up here where we're at, as the weather changes, you know, and gets hotter, we can actually move up to higher elevations and find more. But I mean, there's prairie dogs from Texas all the way up. You know, you've got the Dakotas that are loaded with that stuff. You've got ground schools, all different types. Richardson's up in Montana. Davidson's up, you know, near the border with Canada. I mean, everywhere there's all sorts of things like that. Mm -hmm. Springtime for that. My way of finding them, if I'm looking into an area, is what I do first is I just do a Google search. You know, it'll show up on forums and stuff like that where people, forums for those young people are on a website. You actually have a chat board that nobody in, you know, Menlo Park controls what you say. You just kind of talk about hunting, <laughs> stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Anyways, but um, you can find people asking questions about it and stuff like that. And then, you know, you can go on Google Maps. It, it's really easy to use satellite and look for prairie dog maps. Now, don't mistake them for anthills because there's anthills out there too, but you'll recognize prairie dog mounds or ground squirrel mounds or whatever. And then I'll give one of my biggest secrets just because I'm talking to you. I appreciate that. You want a secret? You go and search for photographs of whatever varmint you're after because photographers love to paste all the information on there. I took a picture of this prairie dog with my Nikon, whatever, such and such, you know, outside of Cedar City, you know, whatever, you know, at this time of year and the lighting was this and, you know, all that stuff like that. And I'll tell you what, I find so many spots because photographers, rock chucks, you know, they take pictures of rock chucks and they'll say, oh, yeah, I was, you know, on this side of Salt Lake City up in the hills over here and I can just find that area and you know they're going to be in that area. That's and I have gone completely like only having Onyx, Google Maps, and some photographer and gone somewhere and been able to pull into a canyon and have a day of shooting rock chucks, which I don't shoot all of them. Again, I move slowly down the canyon and had a day of that because 
They just love putting the information out there. Okay, so I want to share a secret of mine with you and all the <laughs> listeners also, because stuff like that, I am a fan and a proponent. I'm also a school teacher, so I believe in working smarter, not harder. You don't have to, right. you know, go muscle grit through everything if you can figure out the way to, to do it the most efficient way. So being from the state of Washington and being a bear hunter, what I have found is you let hikers do the scouting for you. <laughs> You go to any trail report website for a specific state and you type in whatever like, you know, mountain or trailhead that you that you're looking at hunting. And you can even go into the history of the logs and yeah. by date be like, okay, I'm going to be hunting bears from August 10th to August 15th. And you go back and you can see what the history is year to year. And people just give it away. They're, these hikers are like, the berries are in in such good force. They were delicious. We saw wildlife. We saw bear. We saw deer, yeah. grouse. Like, I'm like, yeah, baby, give me more. Come on. Like, <laughs> well, what's funny is in California, um, we did the same thing when we were hunting bear. You know, because we did hunt. I didn't shoot one, but I've had buddies that shot them. It was the same kind of thing, but campgrounds. You know, oh, we had a bear attack us, you know, and scratch up our truck trying to get to our cooler, you know, and stuff like that. Well, that campground's here, but 100 yards out, it's all public land, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's just hilarious. But, yeah, photographers, you know, hikers, stuff like that, use whatever resources are out there. And as far as getting permission, yes, when you're varmint hunting, they're like, wait, all you want to do is shoot varmints? Yeah. Because most of those guys are geared into big game. We don't want anybody around our big game. And, and then what I suggest to everybody is, is go to lock-in insurance, go to your state farm insurance, go to wherever and get yourself a million dollar umbrella policy. It costs 100, 150 a year. Just get that, keep it in your back pocket. If you've got a guy that you kind of know is right there, ready to give permission, pull that out and say, hey, I'm insured, so I won't do anything. I've never had an issue. But just in case, just so you know, I am insured. I insure myself. Okay, say, say that again because I, this is the first time I've ever heard this before. You're oh, saying yeah, like a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars for an entire year. Yeah, umbrella insurance, and huh. and there's hunting insurance and stuff like that through you know guns, hunting, all that. But I carry an umbrella policy that I'm covered if I shoot somebody's equipment or if I shoot a cow thinking it's a badger, you know, or something like that. Right. If I'm not paying for it out of my pocket, which I'd probably do that because I'd feel so bad about it. Um, I've got that insurance. So the thing is, is I, I don't tell everybody because I don't want farmers being like, oh yeah, you shot my tractor because I need a new one, you know, that kind of thing. Right. But at the same time, if it's a guy that, you know, I'm talking to and I, I'm that close, I'm just that close to getting permission, I just add that as kind of a protection because their biggest fear is that somebody's just going to come in and shoot their place up mm -hmm. you know, and just run rampant everywhere. We've got ranchers we text or call them before we go, you know, we let them know, you know, Hey, so, okay, let me talk about the most recent. We've got a guy over in Oregon and we're up rock truck hunting. So we walked up the hill to see if this one rock truck we got and everything, cause we don't ever just shoot and then leave them. We go hike up there and I'm up there and I see this guy coming by his dogs riding on the front. Okay. And he's coming by in his little ATV and I come by and he's slowing down, looking up at us. So I'm like, that guy wants to talk to us. Mm -hmm. Talk to us. So I start heading down the hill because I see him coming back out. And I come down and we get down to the bottom. And he goes, uh, what are you guys doing? I said, hunting rock trucks. You know, we're on public land. And he said, do you guys shoot ground squirrels? It's like, oh, yeah. He's like, follow me. <laughs> I mean, I have a video up there where, you know, it's it's literally called you guys don't shoot that many ground squirrels or whatever. And I'm like, just boom, 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 boom. We're shooting ground squirrels. Yeah. And that was me and my buddy Pete. You know, we got on there and to this day, we were just there at his place. The ground squirrels weren't out because it was very cold still. Yeah. Uh, the rock checks weren't out, but we're going to be hitting there next week and just going in and we'll call them up. We'll say, hey, we're coming. Is that OK? You know, all this stuff. And we always make sure he knows we're there. We don't ever show up just, you know, without permission unless there's some farmers to just just go. We recognize your vehicles like that. And then you cultivate it. You know, there's guys who 
and notorious waterfowl, big game hunters, stuff like that, where they only hear from you once a year. You know, hey, duck season starts next week. How's it been going? How's life? Well, you know, yeah. we've had a year. And like, oh, that's all great. Can we go duck hunting next week? You know, that's not the way to do it. No. Cultivate these guys. The end of the season. Hey, they're they're wrapping up. This is what we killed. This is how many we killed. We show them pictures of the piles. They're like, oh wow, you shot all those, you know, and you know stuff like that, because they're amazed that people will actually drive that far and spend that money and shoot that ammo just to shoot. Yeah. Bar. Well, let, let's talk about that for a second because I think one of the biggest uh, detractors from varmint hunting is the concept that you're going to be shooting a lot and that gets to be expensive. Yeah. Um, what uh what are some ways about that to mitigate that but yet allow yourself opportunity like can you just go out with a 1022 and shoot 22 yeah. long rifle effectively and and have as much fun or well, do you need a center fire okay so what i always recommend for people who are going to go out with a 10 well let's just say a 22 long rifle no matter what it is mm. is number one use hunting ammo you know, CCI velocitors, you know, they're a little bit slower than the stingers, but they're more accurate. You know, you've got a Gila's got some of that stuff, Federal, you know, everybody's got it, you know, a hunting version. It costs a dollar more, maybe a box, but do that. But but also make sure you're shooting something that's accurate for that gun. Mm. It doesn't matter what I'm shooting. I will try to find the most accurate ammo for that particular gun and then buy as much as that lot or that brand as I can. But yes, by all means, a Ruger 1022. Now, I hold back on predators, you know, coyotes, bobcats, fox, badgers. Some guys do it with 22s. That's totally cool. I would not do it. Okay. It's just something I've shot some when I was younger and it just made me sick because I was looking for coyotes for hours that, you know, I know I hit them. And that's actually in my, my, one of my articles from years ago, from the, I mean, the late 1990s when I started was about why I chose a 17 Remington because I wounded a coyote and I was like, I felt terrible about it. Mm. So I know guys are out there, shoot them, let them die in the dirt, you know, whatever. I can't do that. I just can't. Yeah. So yes, Ruger 1022, you know, 22 long rifle, all that's great. 17 HMR, 22 Magnum is a bump up from that. Okay. That ammo has gone up in price, but you're still looking at maybe $16 a box of 50. Okay. That's 15, 50 rounds for 16 bucks. You know, and then if you really want to go center fire, there's some options out there. Um, let's use 223. Mm -hmm. 223. To this day, people will argue who kills more coyotes with what. I'm sorry, the 223 still holds it. I guarantee you, every year more coyotes are shot with a 223 than anything else. Yeah. And I I know you need a 300 win mag nowadays because oh 223 won't do it. But guess what? We all shot coyotes and they all died with 223s back then. So, you know, you don't need the latest and greatest. Those are all fun. I shoot a 22 Grendel, you know, 22 Arc, you know, all that stuff too. But heck, we go back to the 223 all the time. But pick the right ammo. Um, there's And what's great about it is there's so many good options. There's meat ammo. Has their 40 grain uh, furry dog be gone ammo or whatever. And it's relatively cheap. You get a little ammo box, you get 200 rounds, you know, all that stuff. They go on sale sometimes. And that thing is wicked. I was shooting, I was over in uh, Wyoming shooting prairie dogs with it a couple of years ago. And I was shooting prairie dogs, 272 yards, I think was my farthest. Now it's a pretty big heavy barrel 223 with a big old vortex on it. But, you know, that and then, um, you know, a couple other ones out there, ADI ammo is basically made in Australia. I don't know how they do it, but they use Sierra, Sierra Blitz King bullets, which super accurate load and everything, most everything I shoot. And then it's shipped back here, and it's still the cheapest hunting ammo out there. Interesting. You know, it's it's crazy. But you can do all that, but ultimately, don't go out shooting full metal jacket. You know, oh, well, I got these, you know, $5.99 a box back when it was cheap. You know, this, you're, it's going to poke holes in it. You're not going to you're not going to get the results you want, mm -hmm. which is a quick, clean kill. And also, you might want a little bit of, you know, up in the air, air time and things like that. So, but... Uh, you know, at the end of it, if you're doing enough of it, it all boils down to hand loading. I mean, even today with prices and availability and everything with primers, I mean, we went from, I've got boxes of primers with $11 and $16 price tags on it for a thousand. We're talking bench rest primers. 
Now they're 70 bucks. That's about where they've kind of sat at. Powder is goes, it ebbs and flows with availability and pricing and stuff like that. Um, but when you sit down and crunch the numbers, where you look at a pound of powder is 7,000 grains. 223 you're shooting, let's say 19 and a half grains of IMR 4198. That's a lot of rounds out of one pound. Yeah. Of powder. Yeah. You know, and you can add all your stuff and then divide, let's say the 223 brass divided by five times that you hand load it and all that. You will become, I mean, amazed how much money you can save. Mm. Now, time is also money. And most people will tell you, oh, hand loading is relaxing and stuff like that. I love hand loading. And I hear this from so many people. I love hand loading. I hate reloading. It's the prepping of the brass and, you know, all that stuff like that. But you know what? In the long run, I'm more accurate because I develop loads for specific, you know, specific targets. You know, what I'm, what I'm going after. Predators, I may use a different stuff than, let's say, rock chucks or prairie dogs. Mm -hmm. Things like that. But there are options out there. If you need to buy a factory, there's options out there, but ultimately everybody should get into hand loading because you don't know what's going to be happening years from now. What you guys are seeing now has been happening since the 1980s. Okay, When it was in the 90s, primers were unobtainable, literally unobtainable. You could not go into a store and buy primers. That's why I still have boxes with $11 and $16 because when it became available, I was like, I am never going through this again. And, and folks should learn it because it's just something that keeps you shooting when other people can't. And, you know, and it's very handy. Yeah. And you're, you know, it's just something you got to do if you want to continue in this, in this sport, I'll call it a sport. Well, it's a, it also on top of that, it's that much more of a personal connection with the animal, right? So I, my very first black bear that I killed I I shot it with a with hand load that I yeah. I developed. You did that. That's what's awesome about it. Yeah. And yeah. and I was just like that was rad. Like <laughs> like no other way yeah. around it. You know, it's just that much more of a connection with you and everything that you are living and doing and being yeah. and then putting it to use for what it's meant for, right? I had a buddy, um, he was like, man, why, why are you, this is when I bought my first handgun. I turned 21, bought a handgun. He goes, why do you want a handgun? You know what those are for, right? I was like, yeah. He goes, killing people <laughs> or killing things. I was like, well, yeah. And I mean, a gun is a tool, right? And, and you got to have. You know the quote from the movie Shane, right? Dude, that, you know. Say you say that. say it to me. I love that movie. Well, but. it's basically you know the wife is asking Shane, you know this and that, and Shane Shane the movie Shane yeah you get, holds a gun on me. He says, "Gun is just a tool." You know, it's the man. Basically, the paraphrasing, but it's the man behind it. Yep, that's doing. It. Yeah. I mean, we knew that back then. So yeah, yeah. Now, uh, with all the different calibers and specialties and all that stuff. What is your favorite to shoot these days? That's so hard. That's a that's a loaded question, big time. I, I, mean, I, I, I am a weird dude when it comes to that. <laughs> I love old cartridges. My all-time favorite is the 218B. Never okay. even heard of it. There you go. So it's the 218B. And, you know, it's right around the same lines of a 22 Hornet. And what... What's cool about it is a lot of cartridges grew from those cartridges, wildcatters, you know, and all this stuff. And, and and quite honestly, you look at the cartridges being released today, you know, and and we hear it all. And no no dig at Hornady, you love Hornady and all that stuff. But you know, meticulously designed by our engineers and this that. It's been there, you know. It, it's it's been there. Yeah. So you know they they add some modern aspects to it because they're using modern projectiles and stuff, but yeah. But again, so let me look at last year towards the end of the year. So I made a trade with a guy of a 17 HMR rifle for a Winchester Model 70 from 1964 and 225 Winchester, mm -hmm. which was one of my grail cartridges. And the guy hated it. Oh, I hate this gun and the cartridge. I've got ammo for it. You can have it. I'm like, okay. Oh yeah, and I got one more I hate. And he goes and he pulls out this Ruger 1022 Magnum. 
He's like, yeah, I hate this one too. Like that. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> what, what else you got? <laughs> no kidding, man. But the 225, okay, so there's 22250 and 220 Swift. They've always been doing this. Okay, so back in the 60s, well, before that, the 220 Swift's been out forever. The 222, I'm going to give you a little bit of short history. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, 22250 was actually the 22 Barmer. Um, and it was a Wildcat that was out there. So Winchester, in their ultimate wisdom, goes ahead. And come 1964, they were going to redo the Model 70. And a lot of people say, oh, they ruined it. They actually made a very decent rifle in the post-64s. But they came out and they decided to discontinue the 220 Swift and bring out this new cartridge called the 225 Winchester, mm -hmm. which was slower, harder to, harder to load for, you know, all this stuff like that in this new gun that everybody was going, are you kidding me? And then a few years later, Remington adopted the 22 Barmer to 22250 and the rest is history. Yeah. But, you know, nowadays, so let, let me go back. So 218B, all time favorite. Lately, the fun stuff that I've been shooting, um, obviously the 225 Winchester, that 17.556 KAK, which is absolutely amazing because mm -hmm. I love the 17s. And then, um, you know, in between there, I just finished up, we were using a 243 AI, actually improved. And then I have a 22 BR, not the BRA, the BR, um, that's custom rifle built, ready to go, that I'm going to be developing loads for here. But man, I mean, throw a 22 Grendel slash, or we call it sometimes a 22 Grend Arc. is a little bit different. So Wildcat has 22 Grendel. The 22 Arc has 4,000s more in free bore. Slight differences. Um, I'm shooting a one and eight twist so I can shoot lighter bullets because I'm a varma hunter. Mm -hmm. Throw that and then the Creedmoor. I mean, the Creedmoor reminds me of how I felt when I got the Swift. Just like, oh, damn. You know, oh my gosh. Really? You know, that was 530 yards, I shot that rock truck and I saw him fly up in the air, you know, and it's going to be Creed. And, and I'll tell you what, so meat ammunition I brought up before, we were using some of their 22 Creed factory ammo. And one of my guys who's a long range shooter and everything, I have on video an incredible coyote shot. I mean, incredible. I'm not going to say how far it is, but let's just say it was extremely far and he had to switch to left hand. You know, he's a righty and he had to switch to left hand. Now, you know, was there a little bit of luck in it? Of course, there always is on some of those long shots and yeah. stuff like that. But man, that 22 Creed smoked him. Yeah. Yeah, the 22 Creed's awesome. You know, the it, it's just for me, I get all giddy when the companies, you know, bring out varmint stuff. When the 22 Creed more is adopted, and I'm like, oh, yeah, here we go. I know the guys down in Texas use it for deer and stuff, which is awesome. But for us, it's been in the predator hunting world forever, you know, and we've been using it you know, since Horizon got all their stuff together and started developing stuff and things like that with it, a lot of us adopted it years ago. We we're using it before Hornady, you know, worked with Horizon to bring it to market and everything, which is awesome. What what uh, grain bullet are you pushing on the 22 Creed I'm, for Varmint? The, which one? The 22 Creed. What grain Okay, bullet? so I use a 64 grain Sierra tipped Game King. Okay, that's my number one bullet. Okay, I, I also use a 77 grain Botel hollow point from Mead, which is, it's a match. So, um, you know, how the ELDVT from Horry, the new one is a match varmint, a target varmint type mm -hmm. of thing. Well, that Mead one is the only one I've ever used where I can shoot a ground squirrel this big and have him blow up and also shoot a coyote and drop it in his tracks. Gotcha. It's an amazing bullet. Um, but you have to have the right twist rate. But basically, I'm sticking with the lighter stuff. You know, my my 20 degrees, I have an AR-10. I have a custom build. They're all one and eight twist on mine. Because for varmint and everything like that, you know, I want to shoot a light bullet really fast. Yeah. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Because the impact and the terminal performance and stuff like that is what's cool to me. That's the cool factor. Yeah. And I know guys are using the heavier bullets and stuff. One, one bullet that's out there that... Well, first off, I don't know if the tip game king is discontinued, that 64 grain. Okay, we have yet to hear whether or not they're keeping it. We're getting mixed messages from Sierra. And then Sierra also releases in their factory ammo, their prairie enemy ammo, a 69 grain blitz key. 
that is not available as a component for reloaders. Hmm. Okay. Well, some blem showed up. One of my writer guys, Cash, bought some. We've been loading the 22 Grendel. We've been loading the 22 Creed. We actually have a video where we call Sierra out saying, release this. And all we're showing are, are the rock check. It's like, you watch that. I was videoing it. You know, Cash shot one. I'll never forget. He shot one. And he's like, did I get it? And I'm like, oh, no, you missed it. This thing blew out of the cam camera lens at 250 yards or 200 yards or something like that and disappeared. Just disappeared like that. <laughs> he didn't even know that he hit it because it just blew away so fast. You know, like that. Wow. So, yeah, I'm interested to try the 80s, you know, that are out there on that. Yeah. Let me let me shift gears on on something because what you're talking about is the the tangible uh, reaction that you're getting the visceral feelings of shooting something and 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 watching it explode. Yep. <laughs> I say it giggling because it does kind of make you giggle. I don't it know. Does. You know. Obviously, we're the same type of people. This is where people have a hard time with with varmint right. hunting because we varmint hunters highlight the explosion right you can go onto youtube you can type in right. uh prairie dog massacre or whatever you want and it's just kill shot after kill shot after kill shot of these things just <laughs> exploding and it's kind of fun to watch i enjoy it i i it's like the ultimate whack-a-mole um right. how do you and i so hate that I hate that you have to do it, but how do you defend no, that? No, no, I'm going to do it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the answer that I give to people on YouTube and all that. Yeah. Barman hunters spend thousands of dollars. They create their own, most of the time, create their own loads, you know, or get accurate loads. They go out and shoot groups and practice. They develop ballistic tables. They do all this stuff like that so they can have the most accurate ammunition for that rifle. Mm -hmm. So when they go out, they can shoot this thing and they use a bullet that performs the terminal performance on these animal blows them up. Well, what does a blown up animal mean? It's dead. Yeah. Instant kill. We spend all this money on guns and optics and rifling and everything like that. And, and people laugh at me. Oh, they laugh at me when I pull out my $7,000 Sony a seven S three and my 200, 600 internal lens to video all this stuff. Yeah. No. Yep, um, I got I got mine right. 40, exactly. You know? <laughs> so it, it's just it's something where yeah, I mean, yes, we do. We but that is the end to the culmination. Like you bear hunt, you shoot a bear, it drops, you walk up on it, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, that's great, you know, stuff like that. That is an experience that you yourself feel. Yeah. You know, some guys laugh some guys i'm sure cry you know guys gals you know all that stuff because they're excited or you know can't handle the you know they're shaking you know you've seen the kid who shoots oh yeah kid shaking yeah. you know we all experience it different. and when you shoot something a barn that blows up and it's dead instantly you know most of the time it's dead instantly then yeah i mean you're gonna chuckle a little bit you're gonna laugh i mean my guys for the longest time and it's because of youtube after you shoot something, nobody says anything. Yeah. Okay. But like that coyote I was telling you about, that long range coyote, you're going to hear me. And I never say God in anything like that. I'm literally, I go, oh my God, how far was that? Like 800 and something yards. I'm giving a little bit away. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's just like, I, I didn't even know I was saying that. Yeah. You know, it just came out and the same kind of thing with that. But I asked my guys, Hey, don't, don't laugh. Don't chuckle when you're shooting barmints. Cause I don't want to piss people off and get this and that. But I'll tell you what, once I move some stuff off of YouTube to do more uncensored again, you know, off something else, by all means, you know, show the emotion because yeah. it's there. We all have it. It's there. Yeah. And so do you feel like there's, Okay, it, I, I, let me get my words here on this question because this, and we're gonna I get canceled. <laughs> no, I I believe I put an explicit uh, tag on my podcast because I don't ever want to censor. Right, right, like pff, speak it, you go for it, let it rip. Um, 
I, a part of me wants to title this podcast "Why Varmint Hunting Is Conservation." Right, like that. Yeah. That is a, a something that I want to get through. Not only is it fun, not only is it a great gateway to get people into hunting, all this, but like it's beneficial. Do you feel? And this is this. This is a broad and general question, which is probably not fair, but I'm going to do it anyways. Do you feel like varmint hunting or you as the lead of Varminter Magazine gets the redheaded stepchild uh, view from the general hunting community or like, oh, well, you know, we're... You don't have a critter club, right? It's not Mule Deer Foundation, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you know, American Bear Foundation, or whatever. Like, where's the Varminter Foundation? Yeah, we don't need them. (laughs) So that's another nail in the coffin for us. But you know what? I don't care. I don't care what people think. You know, it's one of those things where, first off, let's go to the conservation thing. Okay. Most of the places I hunt, are on farms, you know, where they're producing either feed for cows, horses, things like that. Mm-hmm. So all these people who are complaining about it, their horse is probably eating, you know, pellets made from alfalfa where we're shooting badgers, ground squirrels, all that off of them because they don't want to use poison because if one gets wrapped up in the bale and then set through the machine, it's a mess. Yeah. Okay. Two, ground squirrels are the ultimate feed source for everything. They eat each other. Okay, a biologist here in Idaho described it as there is no salt out there. These are salt bags. So when one gets shot and that blood gets out there, the other ground squirrels, rock chucks, whatever, smell that and they're like, oh my gosh, it's like having a ribeye and they haven't had meat forever, which you probably know you know nothing about. But anyways, they run over and just start. I mean, I have videos where their face is covered in blood where they've just been eating. And we do a whole, we do funny things about zombie squirrels when they start to eat the other, we have to go after those. And I, I put up a short on YouTube about zombie squirrels and I sped it up and shaking thousands and thousands of views. Is this real, you know, all that. So anyways, that was a side note. But um, yeah, they eat, they eat each other. Coyotes, um, you know, fox, badger, hawks, you know, other raptors, everything out there. We'll be shooting and literally, I have video from just this this last like February, we're shooting all of a sudden, Hawklands, turn, start shooting this way. And I know there's people who say, oh, yeah, the lead poison. This Listen, man, I have seen these guys eat so much of our kills that they have to walk off the field, these birds, because they're so full that they can't really fly. They're just kind of hopping to try to get away. Yeah. You know, that it feeds everything. I mean, everything it feeds out there. And we just kind of speed up that process. We make it a little bit easier. We offer a fresh, you know, well-seasoned meal that's still steaming when it's cold. And they come in and just grab it and gnaw on it. But as far as what people say and and think and everything, guys in the East, all the European people, they don't understand ground squirrels. They don't understand sitting on a field and the whole thing is moving with ground squirrels. Everywhere is ground squirrels. They're used to the east where they get a woodchuck, maybe a couple of them a day, you know, or they're shooting tree squirrels and things like that, which are completely different. Those are a game species. These are varmints. These are like walking in and turning on the light and seeing, I'll say cockroaches, but let's call them rats instead. Rats going everywhere and you're, I mean, just crawling over everything and you just sitting there going, that's cruel to kill them. You know, we discussed that earlier. Yeah. It's the same thing. These farmers, I have literally had farmers drive up and thank us profusely. Thank you so much for coming out. I can't believe you drove 120 miles out. of. I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere sometimes. You drove out here. You know, I've got this extra house. You guys can stay out here when you do it. I'll fire up the heat. You know, all sorts of stuff like that. Because poison is cruel. It's expensive. And most of the farmers out there that do feed crop and things like that can't use them. Yeah. You know, they can't use them. And I mean, shoot in California, I shot on a peach and cherry ranch that was hundred percent organic. They could not use poison, but we could go shoot with our air guns and shoot as many ground squirrels as we could yeah. because that was all cool. I mean, seriously, the governing factor, you know, I think it was Oregon tilth 
who did the approval for their their uh, 100% organic certification said, yeah, that's cool. We're okay with that. But you can't use poison. So fascinating. It's fascinating. Okay, so one of the last questions here, and, and we'll wrap this up. I think we're going to have to have you back on for another episode later down the line, um, is legalities. So hunting license are expensive, especially out-of-state hunting license and tags and, and all that. Do you have to have a hunting license to, to go hunt varmints? Depends on the state. Okay. Well, Idaho, anything with a heartbeat, including Mormon crickets, because I shoot those with air guns too. There's these big, ugly crickets. Yeah. Um, you need a, a hunting license. However, Nevada, you know, um, what is it? I think Utah, you don't. Uh, Wyoming, you don't. You know, there's so many states where you don't need one. You can just show up, pull your guns out, make sure you're legal, you know, make sure you're on public land or have written permission or whatever, and you go and you shoot. And it's just... It's amazing. A lot of that for a coyote too. Mm. You know, when you get into fox and things like that, there are fur bears. Excuse me, but like Nevada with badgers, you don't have to. Wyoming, don't even think about shooting a badger if you're from out of state. Mm. You know, it, so just look at it. But most of the time, varmint hunting is pretty open. It's yeah. pretty open. You can pretty much do it anywhere. You know, I, I hunt Arizona. You need a license for Arizona. You can, but that's the thing. Most states, other than Oregon, who makes me pay $170 a year, but most states have like a little varmint pass. You can come to Idaho and hunt varmints. I think it's like 30 bucks and you get a year long. You can shoot any small game environment. It's a great deal. It's, it's incredible, you know, and, and again, to wrap it up, if you want to get into hunting, and you want to at least get out there and, and get a taste of it and everything like that, there's no better place to start than varmints. Mm. If you've got them in your area or if you've got a place to go and do it, no better place to start. Everything, I don't want to say is easy, but everything comes easier. Yeah. You go, hey, hey, I want to shoot a six by six elk on your property. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, I want the ground throws. Come on, you know, <laughs> right. like that. And it's relaxing and it's fun and it's low pressure if you go out and you shoot 10 or you go out and shoot 200 you're not going to be stressing at the end of the day that oh my gosh you know i just spent thousands of dollars and hundreds on this tag and on yep. you know driving here and all that because you just go out and have fun yeah yeah and it's just it's just awesome i could imagine that the best of the varmint hunters and shooters are probably some of the best shooters out there they are um, the most okay i'll say this. the most fun we have is when we take out guys who are long range shooters or you know prs shooters and stuff and you stick them in a canyon where just you know you've got the different wind coming up from the canyon the breeze you know the mirage you know everything like that say so, hey shoot that rock chuck and it's literally like hit it with the binoculars the range fighters you're like okay that one's at you know 423 yards and they don't have time to do all this, yeah. you know, and to look and pull up the app and stuff like that. I mean, sometimes they do, but most of the time they don't. They just got to get on it and, you know, get to it and make the shot. And it's been, yeah, I've embarrassed myself out there and I've been shooting for for 42 years, you know, <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing wrong? You know, it's nothing. Yeah. But, you know, you, you see the videos on YouTube and guys are all, oh, that was like 200 yards away and you missed. You have no idea what it was like sitting on the edge of that canyon, you know, trying to hold still and, you know, laying prone on a rock and you're looking down a cliff and you know, all this stuff. So it, it's it's very, very humbling for people all lines. And you would just really be surprised how people walk away from and go, OK, that was a lot harder than I thought. Yeah. And but it gets motivated to do it again. Yeah. And I got to do it again. <laughs> Yeah, because yes. it is fun, man. It I love it. Fun. Uh, d- trial, trial by fire at the same time. Yeah. Like, you want to get good at shooting, you want to learn how to hit small, aim yeah. small, miss small, get into varmint hunting. The one thing that I that I always run into those shots where you have all the time in the world to think about it and dial your dope and everything are the ones that I always seem to miss. Mm-hmm. It's the ones where 
It's like, there he is. Okay, camera, I'm rolling. Are you on it? Yeah, I'm on it. You know, hit record, blah, 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 you know, like that. Leave the time so you can edit it. You know, you're sitting there with your breathing and boom, got him. Like yeah. that. You're like, how did that happen? You know, like that. It's just right. awesome. So. I love it. Brother, thank you for coming on. Thanks for sharing exactly. your knowledge and your passion. We it's... definitely need to get together and do some hunts. Dude, let's, we need to film an episode of Soul Seekers. We need to bring out a, a new hunter, put him there on an experience. We'll film it all. We'll put it, release as an episode, and it'll be on Carbon TV. And That'd be awesome. It'll be a great way to you know cross-promote, but at the same time, impact the next generation. Yeah, right? definitely. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get that going and, and all that. Um, anything that we didn't touch that you feel like needs to be shared? Yeah. Um, for everybody out there, we're a community. Yes, we all like to rib each other on social media and, you know, go after people and stuff like that. But in the end, be a true believer. We are all one hunting community. Lift each other up, you know, help each other. And also, and this may can't... Can, it may come off as me being kind of arrogant by saying this, but also don't be afraid to call people out who are giving bad information, who are in our community hmm. or who are not acting in the best interests of our community. Yeah. And I, and I won't get into the details on that. That's for a whole another episode or not even an episode, maybe just a drive in a truck and discuss it. But in the long run, you know, everything we do out there, people look at, and pick your heroes carefully you know especially in the hunting world yeah um and we're all human and listen the guys that get on facebook there's a time to joke around and make fun of people you know we all do it to each other but then there's a time to recognize that that guy's new that gal's new treat him with a little bit of respect answer the question honestly you know guide them in the right direction shoot him a pm and say hey call me you know something like that i mean it, it's just so important because we're all in this together. And I, I went through California. I grew up in the greatest state this country has ever seen, which was California. And I watched it turn to complete garbage Yeah. and treat hunters and shooters and everything. And that's because they knew how to pick us apart and divide us right. and can't have that happen again. There's a famous quote uh, by Dr. Neem, uh, Martin Neemholer that I, I reworded and I shared it uh, on social media and it, a lot of people saw it, but um, first they came for the trappers, and I didn't yep. say anything because I wasn't a trapper. Then they came for the predator hunters, and I didn't say anything because I wasn't a predator hunter. Then they came for the big game hunters, yep. and I didn't say anything because I wasn't a big game hunter. Then they came for me. There's no one left to speak. Yep. We are one, one moment away from losing it all at the exact same time, one moment away from changing and lighting this world on fire to get everybody inspired and lives transformed through the primal adventure of which hunting holds. That's I'm a, true. I'm a big proponent of, you know, the, there's a reason why the First Amendment is the, the first, number one in the Bill of Rights, and that's freedom of speech. The ability to articulate our words in the defense, promotion, or, or uh, grounding of any specific topic is the most important thing that we could ever do. Uh, being a father of three young boys, if I think in my head I love them, but I don't actually verbally, out loud, say it to them, they're going to go yeah. their entire life thinking, man, dad never told me he loved me. So yeah. us as hunters, like you were saying, making sure we're all one community, us as hunters. Also, I wanted to bring this episode here for all you listeners because we need to be able to articulate the defense of hunting. It, it's not varmint hunters versus big game, waterfowl versus predator, trappers versus archery. Like, it does not matter. We're in this. And you need to take all the little nuggets that came through this podcast today, remember them, practice them, say them out loud. Be ready to defend hunting wherever you go, because if you're not going to be the change, then who is? It starts with you. Yeah. So, man, yeah, see, brother, you're getting me all, all ready to rock and roll right now. Well, I mean, two books I grew up on. Um, I forget the author of 
in defense of hunting. You just brought that up. I forget the um, I forget his name. And then I recommend you guys are going to think it's a little oh you know dreamy stuff like that, but a San County Almanac by Aldo Leupold. Oh, he discusses the monetary reasons for having hunting exist. Mm. And what people don't understand is that, yeah, we can sit here and talk about all this stuff, but if people want to boil it down to just sheer numbers, hunting is something that is a huge force. And one day, I hope, I'm a dreamer, but one day hopefully we'll get that force together and make change pro hunting, not just trying to play catch up to the end of hunters. Right. I'm ready to go on offense. I'm tired of being on defense. Exactly. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Brother, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your knowledge, your your inspiration, and your awesome stories. Where can everybody uh, find – where can they find Varmeter Magazine? Just varmeter.com right there. And then we're on Instagram, and, yeah, we're on Facebook too, and then our YouTube channel, which, you know, we're working on that. <laughs> what, <laughs> They've been blocking some of our latest videos, so – yeah, the big, big government, big censor me daddy harder, right? Oh, it's, an election. it's an election year. They do it every election oh, year. It's funny. So, so crap. Brother, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, guys, if you enjoyed this episode, the number one thing that you can do is is share it, like it, spread the word. Be like, hey, do you varmint hunt? Do you, do you know how to speak about it? Do you know how important it is? got to go check out this episode. Share the podcast. Go follow along. Subscribe uh, to Varmer Magazine. Get connected. There are people that are willing to help, willing to support you on your journey. But if you're keeping silent to yourself, you're never going to get the, the help, support, network, community, anything that you want and, or that you need. Yeah. Remember that hunting has the power to transform lives through primal adventure, and you can never outgive good as mentorship is conservation. I'm Johnny Mack and Eric Meyer. Thank you so much. Be blessed, freedom on, and as always, stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast and want to support the show, you can always like, share, subscribe, and leave a rating as it helps us share our mission of mentorship is conservation. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of Soul Seekers Nation as we transform lives through primal adventure. If you want to get more connected with the podcast, check out the Soul Seekers Nation Facebook group as I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. So stay tuned and stay soulful.